Shalom. We are back and we are in the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 1, verse 2 now, where it's written, And all the brothers who are with me to the assemblies of Galatia. We'll want to break this verse down because there's a lot here, even though it's a short verse. But we want to define our terms. Number one, we want to know what slash who are the assemblies that's often translated in a lot of their versions as churches or church. What is the church? Basically, we want to know. Um, and also this term over here, Galatia, where and who were the Galatians? These will be very important questions to answer to get the uh, deeper meaning of who Paul's writing to in the context of the letter. So without further ado, we're going to jump in and try to look a little bit at uh, the assemblies today because a lot of people, whether they realize it or not, they have a view of the word church that is quite different than the scriptural understanding. And we want to look at that today. And one of the major um, teachings in evangelical Christianity is dispensationalism, or also known as replacement theology. And they have divided the scripture up into the age of law versus the age of grace. The old versus the new. Israel versus the church. They basically state that the church is a distinct entity from Israel. And it's interesting, they allude to this age of the church started in Acts 2 at Pentecost to the pre-trib rapture. Now, I believe this is absolutely one of the most horrific false teachings of the church. And a lot of people believe in this, and we want to address this because you're not going to be able to understand much if this is your um, view of the church. And I want to draw your attention to the stake or the cross over here. Notice that it is on the side uh, dispensation of law. Now, earlier I had mentioned when talking to other ministers and asked them, do they follow Messiah or do they follow Paul? And the ones that have said, we follow Paul, the reason why they say that is based off this type of theology or thinking, where Messiah and his teachings are in the age of law, and some of them include the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even the book of Acts in some cases, and they'll say, well, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do the words of the king. We're in the age of the church, or age of grace, and we're going to follow the writings of Paul. Um, since he's uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, and he's done away with Torah. That's how they understand it. Again, this is absolutely false teaching, and uh, we're going to look at this a little bit closer. One of the things we want to look at is, one of the claims is that the church um, receives the New Testament. You'll hear this a lot, that, oh, we're a New Testament church, a New Covenant, we don't want nothing to do with Torah. Yeah, we're not under the, the curse of the law and things like that. So we want to look at this. We also want to answer, did Messiah come to start a new religion? A common quote or idea that a lot of people in this um, theology have is very similar to in the book Things to Come by Dwight J. Pentecost, where he writes, After the day of Pentecost, until the rapture, we find the church. There is no continuing remnant of Israel with whom God is dealing with today. Because that nation is now blinded, God cannot have a remnant within the nation. For one, this is pretty presumptuous to say God cannot have. Um, just to start off. But furthermore, this idea that there can't be a remnant of Israel present today this is a major thing, because they realize there can only be one body. Scripture is clear, one body. There can't be two. So what they've done is basically come up with a theology that does away or puts Israel at recess, and then the, this Gentile entity then has the floor until the, they're swooped away at the rapture before any tribulation hits. Then Israel's back on the scene, and the Creator can deal with Israel at that point. 
this is that theology. So anyways, we're going to address this and look at the scriptures and see what actually the scriptures um, show us in regards to this. Is there not a remnant of Israel today? So jumping right in, we're going to be looking at Torah patterns and just go right down the list and see what Messiah taught, what his disciples taught, and what happened in that early assembly. Was there a new religion started or is it this the same message we've heard from the beginning? Is the scriptures congruent or are they completely confused? This is really the question we need to ask. We're going to start in the book of Isaiah at the prophecy regarding Messiah. In verse, uh, this is 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty El, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government in the peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahuwah hosts will perform this. We see the start of the fulfillment of this in Luke chapter 1 verses 30 through 30. Um, Two, where it's written, And the messenger said to her, Do not be afraid, Miriam. You have found favor or grace with Elohim. And see, you shall conceive in your womb and shall give birth to a son. And his name shall be called Yahusha. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And Yahuwah Elohim shall give him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Yaakov, which is Jacob, forever. And there shall be no end to his reign. So we see right off the bat in the prophecy from Isaiah and in Luke that Messiah was destined to rule over, be the king over Israel. This is important. Then we see as we go down through this list here in the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 4, we see Yah appoints 12 heads or leaders over the 12 tribes of Israel. This same pattern is followed in Luke 6, 12 through 16, where Yahushua Messiah appoints 12 apostles that will eventually be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We see that number 12 deals with the number of government or kingdom business, specifically with Israel. In Numbers chapter 11, and, uh, verses 16 and 17, we see that the 70 elders of Israel were given the spirit to help take the load or the burden off of Moses in regarding to the kingdom. We also see in Luke 10, 1, where Messiah sends out the 70 two by two to preach the kingdom message um, as well. So we see this pattern being matched. And then, again, the number 12 has to do with uh, government and the number 70 has to do with the nations. Remember, Israel is supposed to be a light to the nations. We also see in Matthew 15, verse 24, let me just turn there real quickly here. Uh, Messiah gives a very deep, uh, basically says what his mission is while he's here on the earth, which for a lot of people, this is a lot different than what they've been taught. And he answered, he said, I was not sent except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he tells us that he was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Later on, or actually in Matthew 10, 5 and 6, he also sends his taught ones out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He doesn't have them just going after Gentiles or just random people, but specifically the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In John 10, 16, we further see this in the passage dealing with the good shepherd, where he says, I have... Other sheep which are not of this fold, he was with Yehuda. I shall bring them as well, and they shall hear my voice. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is an allusion, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the history of Israel, um, after Solomon, the kingdom was divided into the northern house and the southern house, and th they have never been joined together again. So the prophecies in Isaiah 49 and Ezekiel 37 talk about there's going to be a restoration of the two houses, the two sticks, the two folds back together. So Messiah's mission 
is to start that restoration process with Israel, the two houses coming back together, that he's actually in the business of restoring Israel. We don't see him starting something new, but a restoration work. So the message he was really preaching was restore, or the other, in other words, repent, for the kingdom of Elohim is at hand. In Luke 22, 15, 16, 20, 29, and 30, we, we start to get a better insight into the renewed covenant where he is with his taught ones at Passover and he, he's going to renew the covenant via the Passover meal and later on uh, the next day, on Passover day, he, he would actually die to renew the covenant with Israel. We want to read about this a little bit. This is in uh, Luke 22, verses 15 and 16. And he says unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before my suffering. For I say to you, I shall certainly not eat of it again until it is uh, filled in the reign or the kingdom of Elohim. Jumping down to verse 19. And taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 quotes this. And do this in remembrance of me is a reference to remember Passover and the Lamb of Elohim. Through the blood of the Lamb, we can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from bondage to freedom. And this is really huge. Via the covenant. This is what this is all about. In verse 20, Likewise, the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the renewed covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. His blood was shed for the renewed covenant. We're going to talk about that here in a second, but we're going to jump down to verse 29 and 30, which he's talking to his taught ones still. And I covenanted for you as my father covenanted for me a reign or a kingdom to eat and drink at my table in my reign or kingdom and sit down on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve apostles are destined to uh, judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And we want to read from the prophet Jeremiah uh, or Jeremiah about this renewed covenant. This can also be found in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and 10, but I'm going to read it from the prophet so you can get an idea from there. This is in 31 verse 31 through 30, we'll go to 34, but See, the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when I shall make a new covenant. Now, right here, he's going to talk about the new covenant. So we should find that he's going to be making a new covenant with the church. We'll see what, see what the scriptures say here. And I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Wait a second here. It says the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. We need to read this again to make sure this is correct. See, the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. You see, the new covenant is not with a Gentile entity called the church. It is specifically with Israel, the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. Let's keep reading. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim. My covenant, which they broke, Though I was a husband to them, declares Yahuwah. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So we also see not only is it the new covenant with the house of Israel, the two houses, but it's also about the Torah being written on the heart. This is different from the first time where it was written on stone. This time, according to Ezekiel, via the Spirit, he writes it on our hearts and our minds that we will actually walk it out and do it. We also find in verse 34, it says this, And no longer shall they each teach one, uh, one his neighbors, each one his brothers, saying, No, Yahuwah, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahuwah. For I shall forgive their crookedness and remember their sins no more. So if Messiah is renewing the covenant at Passover with his taught ones, and he's going to forgive their sins. Not only is he going to re renew the covenant through his blood, 
uh, for Israel, to restore Israel, but also forgive their sins, then he's not doing away with Israel. That he's actually restoring Israel via his sacrifice on Passover. So we see that, that the new covenant is all about restored Israel. The Messiah came to restore Israel. And we also see this new covenant is about the Torah, specifically being written on our hearts. That we actually walk it out and do it. Now, this is interesting, and this ties in perfectly, because after Messiah was dead for uh, three days and three nights and rose from the grave, we see, and he was uh, here for 40 days uh, uh, preaching the kingdom of Elohim, in Acts 1, we have a very awesome question. We've already mentioned this before, but in Acts 1, 6, his top ones ask, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he tells them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has appointed, but you shall receive power uh, or authority when the Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Yehuda, and also in Shomeron and the farther parts of the, the earth, the four corners of the earth. And what you may not realize, those are the two capitals of the southern house, Yehuda, and the northern house, Israel. Now, what's interesting is that's the context of Acts um, chapter 2, where is the whole Pentecost event, or Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. And this is interesting, because this is when they say the church was born on a Israelite festival. And more interestingly, this Israelite festival, if you study that Acts 2, Israelites were there. The, the, even though there was a small percentage of proselytes or Yah fears, those are people like, if we read it in the book of Ruth, or in Isaiah 56, people that had joined themselves to Israel, that they were there, devout people, for the feast. Pagans, or true Gentiles, don't go up to the feast of Shavuot. Only devout people. These are people that are already in covenant with Yah, that feared Yah, that were keeping His commandments, were there. And we want to, I want to show you something you may not be aware of, but Israel was being addressed in Acts 2. And when Peter stood up to... Um, address the crowd, you'll notice in Acts 2, verse 14, that he says, Men of Yehuda, remember, he's addressing, that's the southern house, men of Yehuda, and all those dwelling in Jerusalem. Then if you go down to verse 22, then he says, Men of Israel, that's the northern house. Then if you go to verse 36, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel. Now he's addressing the whole house. This message on Acts 2 is all about Israel. It's specifically their question in Acts 1-6 about the restoration of Israel. Messiah is basically telling them that once they receive power on this very day, that they would be part of the restoration work before, before the two houses, a witness to both of them. And here we're seeing the fulfillment of that right here, where he, he then preaches... Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that Elohim has made this Yahushua, whom you impel, both Master and Messiah. So here we have uh, Peter proclaiming the good news. And having heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Kepha and to the rest of the missionaries, Men and brothers, what shall we do? That's when Peter said to them, Repent and let each one of you be immersed in the name of Yahushua Messiah for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the set-apart spirit. So we see that this is actually not the start of something new, a new Gentile entity, but this is a, something within Israel, a restoration of the two houses becoming one. This is what Ephesians was, uh, ta 2 was talking about, where the two have become one through the stake. And now we're being built upon the foundation of Yahushua Messiah, the twelve uh, apostles, and the prophets to build up the spiritual house. So... This is huge. This, we, we don't see anywhere when we look through the scripture, we see Messiah came to be king of Israel. That he um, sent the twelve out specifically to uh, preach the good news to the Israel. We see the, just the patterns all matching uh, with the ancient patterns from the Torah. We see the message is actually restore, repent. We see the new covenant is with Israel and has all to do about the Torah and the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, he's not doing away with his people. We see in Acts 1, which is the context of Acts 2, 
that the, the, the main theme is still the restoration of Israel. Then we see in Acts 2, the beginning of that, the two sticks coming together. And still to this day, that work is underway. It has not been fully fulfilled yet, but it is still at work. And we want to address Mr. Pentecost's uh, statement about uh, no, there's no remnant in the, the earth today. Um, that, uh, that, uh, according to him, God can't use a remnant of Israel today. We want to address that and see if the scriptures actually teach that. And if we go to the book of Romans, chapter 11, which this whole chapter has to deal with um, the restoration of Israel. You may not be aware of this, but Romans 11 is basically Paul's commentary on Ezekiel 37. The, the sticks, the trees, uh, the, the words, and everything matches up. If you study those two chapters, a lot of things are going to click for you. But let's go to the beginning of chapter 11 and read and see if Yah has rejected his people. I say then, has Elohim rejected his people? Question mark. Let it not be, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Elohim has not rejected his people whom he knew beforehand. Or do you not know what the scriptures say of Eliyahu, which is Elijah, how he pleads with Elohim against Israel, saying, Yahuwah, they have killed your prophets and have overthrown your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the answer of Elohim say to him? I have left for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, therefore, also at this present time, a remnant according to the choice favor has come to be. Well, Paul is saying that in Eliyahu's day, there was apostasy. It was great. Israel was messing up. He didn't think anyone was left. He was like, it's just only me. But Yah rebuilt him. There was a faithful remnant that still had not gone, totally gone apostate. There was a faithful remnant keeping the commands. Paul is mentioning, using that example to say in his day, this is in Romans, this is after Pentecost, that there is still a faithful remnant today. We read in Revelation chapters um, 12, 7 and uh, 14, uh, 12, that there is a remnant, those who keep the commandments of Yah and have the, uh, the witness or the faith of Yahushua Messiah. And to this very day, there is still a faithful remnant that is keeping the commandments and has a faith in Yah. And it's been going throughout history. So it may not be a big group, but it's been growing. And the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 is well underway. There will be one fold and one shepherd. And uh, this whole idea of look at this again, this dispensational theology where replacement, where we saw the church replacing Israel and the church having this new covenant, we can't find it in the scripture. We don't see this. The new covenant is with Israel. And not only that, the new covenant has to do with the Torah being applied to our hearts. We saw that the new covenant was with both houses of Israel. So we need to answer a very serious question. What is the church? And obviously, this idea of a Gentile entity being birthed at Acts uh, 2.1 is literally made up. There's, there is not a Gentile entity that the Father in Heaven has a covenant with. You can look throughout the whole entire scripture. There is no covenant with a Gentile entity called the church. Nevertheless, we're going to find out what this word church is involved in. And once you understand the meaning of it, all the scripture is going to be congruent and snapped together. Until next time, we'll be, we'll be looking at this word next time, but until then, if you haven't repented, which means turning away from your sin, the things that you know are against the violation of His word, you need to repent. Turn towards Yah, put your trust in His Son, Yahushua Messiah, and keep His Torah. Shalom.